The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Preaxer Zemium Fungicide, and Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans. Bernard Tobin here today catching up with Rob Miller from BASF. Rob, how's it going? Great. How are you doing, Bern? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's great to be back at the Mary Hill Research Station here at BASF. Um, Want to talk about weed control. It's been cool and damp. And mm -hmm. as we get out here, um, you're thinking about plan A, plan B, and even a plan C for weed control. What do you mean when you with that strategy? Yeah, definitely. So all winter we've been talking about, you know, making sure you have a plan A, get your products in place, plan B, but even that plan C. So you don't want to take that plant now, spray later approach, especially this year. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you're using that soil applied residual chemistry that can only be applied pre-plant or pre-emergence, that will not cause injury to the, the crop once it's emerged. You don't want to get that crop coming out of the ground getting ahead of you and the weeds coming up at the same time. So make sure you have that plan A, plan B and plan C and definitely talk to your retailer. Yeah, um, let's talk about uh, resistance. Um, Dr. Peter Sikama, Ridgetown College, University of Guelph reported, we've got resistance in glyphosate resistance in common ragweed. Um, more and more we're seeing this type of thing. What do we need to think about from a strategy perspective and management here? Multiple modes of action? Multiple modes of action, but multiple modes of effective action. You wanna make sure that that herbicide program has multiple modes of action on that target weed species. And it's not only common ragweed that's starting to, to move across province that's resistant to glyphosate, it's also the water hemp, the canda flea bane. All canda flea bane is pretty much resistant to the glyphosate and the group two chemistry. And we're seeing those multiple resistant water hemp starting to move, especially you know along the riverbanks and stuff like that. It's moving across the province probably much faster than we anticipated. But it's not only glyphosate resistance, it's some of those other top problem weeds, the lamb's quarters, the bluegrass, the pigweed, just the regular pigweed, the nightshade. Those are some weeds that we still have to have multiple modes of effective action. And even if you're using some of this newer herbicide technology, so the Extend Flex technology or the Enlist E3 technology, that's where we don't want to just rely on those group fours and the glyphosate to control some of these weeds. You still must use multiple modes of effective action and utilizing that soil applied residual chemistry. Rob, this winter, a lot of discussion about pre-emerge, you know, soil applied herbicides. Let's talk about getting them down and making them most effective. You know, do we need an activating rain? How do we put that pre-emergence in a position to be most successful? Definitely, so soil applied residual chemistry is very important because you get, it decreases that selection pressure on the in-crop herbicide application. So you tend to get more uniform emergence. And when it comes to activating rain, all soil applied chemistry requires rainfall for activation. So it's really important to understand that chemistry. Some only requires maybe a quarter to a half inch. Some other chemistry requires more, you know, half inch to three quarters of an inch for activation. Even if we don't get that activating rain in the first seven to 10 days, that herbicide is still gonna be active. Majority of the products that we use here in Ontario are not broken down by sunlight. So it's still gonna be remain active on that soil surface. And once we do get that activating rain, it'll activate that, that chemistry and control some of those later flushes of weeds. You might have to come in there a little bit earlier with your in-crop herbicide, but you still see the benefit because you're still, that soil applied residual chemistry, even without that activating rain, is still gonna provide, you know, 70, 80% weed control. Awesome. Let's talk about um, reading the label, understanding the label and making real good sort of choices. How important is that? And especially, you know, there's also concerns about antagonism. We gotta make good decisions. Yes, definitely. So understand the label. Number one thing for this season is do not cut rates. Do not use half rates. We have those labeled use rates and those rate ranges for a reason based on the specific weed pressure. So do not cut the rates. And especially once we start using those lower rates, that's where we start running into issues with antagonism. So specifically with glyphosate, maybe with some of the, uh, the clay-based chemistry, so the atrazines, the metribuzin, once we start reducing that rate, that's where we start to see more antagonism mm -hmm. on certain weed species. So maybe some dandelions, some, uh, some cover crops, like you know, trying to terminate some cereal rye, some grasses as well. That's where it tends to show up first. And it usually happens when we use those lower, lowest labeled use rates tank mix with mm -hmm. that. Couple things to consider when consulting the label. Always use higher water volumes, especially if you are using some of those contact herbicides. Talk to your chemical rep, 
talk to your CCA, talk to your agronomist. They might have an understanding on what, what type of chemistry has been used. Or if you are using some of these new tank mixes that might be available this year, that's where you know you want to understand that mixing order. So, so consult the label, consult your agronomist to, in order to get the, off to the best start possible. Awesome. And hey, um, stewardship is always a consideration, especially if you're, you're using particular chemistry. Yes, again, it all comes down to understanding which, which chemistry you're using on that field. Products like Dicamba have specific uh, regulations and, and label recommendations and stewardship practices that we must use. So something like, uh, you know, not spraying during temperature inversions, utilizing those nozzles and, and spraying when you get the most activity on some of those problem weeds. Hey, let's wrap this up with a look at this field, for example. And mm -hmm. you talk about what growers sh should be doing now. You say aggressive and timely scouting. Talk about that. What's the strategy? That is going to be key for this year. And, and we always say aggressive scouting. Get in there, you know, on a timely basis. We always want to spray those herbicides when the weeds are smaller and actively growing. Some of these weed species, like water hemp, can actually grow an inch a day. So if we actually delay that scouting by two or three days, that weed has actually grown two or three inches under those ideal conditions. So that's where aggressive scouting is going to be key for this year, utilizing that chemistry. Some of these weeds, you know, are going to be tough to control, especially this season. And looking at this field, you know, higher water volumes as well. That's where you look at, you know, some of this trash is here. We might be going in there with, uh, with some tillage implement. We always want to spray prior to that tillage pass as well. So timely, aggressive scouting is going to be key for the 2022 season. Awesome. Great insights, Rob. Great, always great to have you on Reed Ag. Thanks for having me.